All right, cool creatures. We are back with chapter 22, Captured. Speaking of schedules and countdowns, Mr. Ages spoke suddenly. We've got one for this evening. It's getting late. The clock on Nicodemus's desk said five o'clock. Mrs. Fitzgibbon feeds dragons, feeds dragon at 6 p.m. He spoke gently, but his voice had a chilling sound to Mrs. Frisbee. They all looked at her. I'm ready, she said quietly, but there are still a few minutes and one question you have not yet answered. Why did Jonathan never tell me anything about Nim or any of the rest? Mr. Ages said, I'll try to explain. When Nicodemus and the others moved into the cave near the rose bush, they invited Jonathan and me to stay with them. After all, we had been with them for many months by that time. And at first we did. But after a few weeks, we decided to move out. We were, you realize, different. We both felt strange associating always with only rats, even though they were our close and good friends. As for me, I wanted more solitude and less society. Jonathan, on the other hand, was younger than I and felt lonely. So we moved at first together to the basement of the old farmhouse where I live still. Then Jonathan met you at a stream near the woods somewhere, I think he said. Yes, Mrs. Frisbee said, I remember. From then on, he worried. He didn't want to be secretive, but he didn't know how to tell you one thing. I'm sure Nicodemus has explained to you that the injections we got at NIM had two effects. One of them was that none of us seemed to be growing any older at all. The children, yes, but not the adults. Apparently, the injections had given us all a much longer lifespan than even Dr. Schultz had anticipated. You can see why this would have been a dreadful thing for Jonathan to have to tell you. You never had the injections. That meant while he stayed young, you would grow older and older and finally die. He loved you, and he could hardly stand that thought. Yet, if it was distressing to him, he thought, how much more painful it would be to you. That is what he could not bring himself to tell you. He would have told you eventually. I know he intended to. Indeed, you would have found it out yourself. You would have seen it happening. But it was hard. He kept putting it off, and then finally, it was too late. Poor Jonathan, said Mrs. Frisbee. He should have told me. I wouldn't have minded, but will my children also have longer lives, said Nicodemus. We don't know yet. We think so, but our, old, our own children are not yet old enough to be certain. We do know they have inherited the ability to learn. They master reading almost without effort. He stood up, took out his reading glass, and looked at the clock. But Mrs. Frisbee interrupted again. One more thing, she said. What happened to Jenner? Nicodemus said he left. He was against the plan from the start. In our discussions, he tried to persuade others to oppose it. Only a few joined him, though. There are some others who are still doubtful about it. They're going to stay with us and try it. The argument stayed reasonably friendly, but the last straw for Jenner was when we decided to destroy the machines. Destroy them? For two reasons. One, so that anyone, if anyone ever finds the cave, there won't be any evidence of what we've been doing. Nothing but broken bits of metal, debris, that will look like ordinary junk. We'll put our electric cable, our lights, and our water pipes. We'll close up all the tunnels leading in. The other reason is more important. When we move to Thorn Valley, we're going to have some hard times. We know that, and we're braced for it. If this cave is still open with the machines and lights and the carpets and running water still here, there will be a terrible temptation to give up and move back to the soft life. 
we want to remove the temptation. But when Jenner heard this decision, it was made at a meeting, he grew really angry. He denounced us all as idiots and dreamers. He stamped out of the meeting, and a few days later, he left the group forever, taking six of his followers with him. We don't know where they went, but we think they will try to find some place where they can set up a new life like this one. I wish them luck, but they'll have trouble. There won't be any toy tinker this time. They'll have to steal their machines, everything. What worries us some, because if they get caught, who knows what might happen, but there's nothing we can do about it. We're going ahead with the plan, and once we get to Thorn Valley, I think we can stop worrying. Justin stood up. It's time to go. He picked up the paper with the sleeping drought in it. Mrs. Frisbee, Justin, and Mr. Ages walked together up the long corridor to the rose bush. Remember, when you come through the hole in the kitchen floor, Mr. Ages said, you'll be under a cabinet. It's low, but there's room to move. Go a few steps forward and you'll be able to see out into the room. Mrs. Fitzgibbon will be there, getting dinner for her family. They eat at about six. When she's got their dinner ready, she'll feed Dragon. He won't, hi, Bibi. He won't be in the kitchen, but he'll be waiting just outside the kitchen door on the porch. She doesn't let him in while she's cooking because he makes a pest of himself, rubbing up against her ankles and getting between her feet. If you look to your right, you'll see his bowl. It's blue and it has the word kitty written over and over again around the side. She'll pick it up, fill it with cat food and put it down again in the same place. Then watch closely. She'll walk over to the door to let him in and that's your chance. Her back will be toward you. She's got to walk about 20 feet. It's a big kitchen. The bowl will be about two feet away from you. Be sure the paper packet is open. Then dash out, dump the powder into the food and dash back. You don't want to be in sight when Dragon comes in. I can tell you that from experience. Is that how you got hurt? I got there a few seconds late. I decided there was still time. I was wrong. At the arch in the rose bush, Mr. Ages left them. With his cast, he would not be able to climb through the hole in the kitchen. There was no point in him going any further. Mrs. Frisbee and Justin moved out of the rose bush and looked around them. It was still light, though the sun was low on the horizon. Just ahead of them, perhaps 200 feet away, stood the big white farmhouse. Dragon was already on the porch, sitting just outside the door, looking at it expectantly. To the right was the tractor shed, and beyond that was the barnyard fence and the barn itself. Casting a long shadow behind them rose the woods and the mountains. To the left, Mrs. Frisbee could see the big stone in the middle of the garden near which her children waited. As soon as her task was done, she thought she must hurry back to them and get them ready for the move. We go under the right side of the house, Justin said quietly. Follow me. They made their way around the edge of the yard, sitting, staying in the shadows, keeping an eye on Dragon. Justin still wore his satchel and had put the powder package in. There was a basement under the main part of the Fitzgibbons house, but the big kitchen had been added later and stood on a foundation of concrete blocks with only a crawl space beneath. As they approached this gray foundation, Mrs. Frisbee saw the near, that near the middle of it, a few inches off the ground, there was a square patch of darker gray. It was a hole left for ventilation and that and there was a screen over it. When they reached it, Justin caught hold of the screen, pulled the corner. It swung open. We loosened it a bit, he explained, holding it open for her. Mrs. Frisbee crept through. Careful, he said. It's dark. There's a drop about a foot. Just jump. We put some straw at the bottom so it's soft. Holding her breath, Mrs. Frisbee jumped blindly into the blackness and felt the cushion of straw under her feet. In a moment, Justin landed beside her. 
They were under the Fitzgibbons kitchen. Now, he said softly, look to your left. See the patch of light? That's the hole. The light comes from the kitchen. We've piled dirt up under it so it's easy to reach. Come on. Mrs. Frisbee followed him. As they got near the bright hole, she could see around her a little. They were walking across bare earth, dry and cool to the touch. Overhead, there were heavy wooden beams holding up the floor, and above those, the floorboards themselves. Under the hole rose a small round hill of dirt. They walked up this, and then Justin whispered, this is as far as I can go. There's not room for me to get through. I'll wait here. Come back down as soon as you're finished. Here's the powder. He handed her the paper packet. Remember to tear op it open before you get out to Dragon's Bowl. Hurry now. I can hear Mrs. Fitzgibbon moving around. She's getting the dinner. Be careful and good luck. Mrs. Frisbee first pushed the packet up through the hole, then as quietly as she could, grasping both sides, she pulled herself up and into the kitchen. It was there. It was light. But Mr. Ages had not been joking when he said the ceiling was low. And there was less than an inch between the floor and the bottom of the cabinet, so that she could not walk properly, but had to flatten herself out and crawl. She did a few steps and discovered that she was trembling. Stay calm, she told herself. Don't get panicky or you'll do something foolish and spoil everything. Thus admonished, she crept forward again until she was near the edge of the cabinet. She stopped. From there, she could see out into the kitchen fairly well. Straight across from her stood a big white gas stove and in front of it, putting the lid on a pot was Mrs. Fitzgibbon. Because the edge of the cabinet was so low, Mrs. Frisbee could not see her head, but only up to her shoulders. There, Mrs. Fitzgibbon said, as if to herself, the stew is done and the bread's in the oven and the table is set. Where was the cat's bowl? Mrs. Frisbee looked to her right as Mrs. Mr. Ages had said. There it was, blue with words inscribed around the side. Yet something was wrong. It was not two feet from the cabinet, but more like four or five. In the corner where it should have been rose four round wooden legs. She realized that she was looking at the bottom of the kitchen stool. No matter, she thought, the extra distance is just a couple of feet and Mr. Agents, Mr. Ages had not mentioned a stool, but perhaps they moved it around. She crawled to her right as close to the bowl as she could get without showing herself and tore open the package. Just as she did this, Mrs. Fitzgibbon walked over from the stove. Her hand appeared, picked up the bowl, and Mrs. Frisbee heard it thump on the counter. Over her head, a cutting sound, a can opener, the scrape of a spoon, and the bowl was back on the floor. The strong, fishy smell of cat food. Mrs. Fitzgibbon walked away. Now. Mrs. Frisbee moved swiftly out into the room, across the open floor, holding the powder, her eyes intent only on the bowl. She was no longer trembling. She poured in the powder, which instantly dissolved in the moist cat food. Still clutching the paper, she turned and sped toward the cabinet. With a bang, the lights went dim. The ceiling, which had somehow become curved, was filled with little round moons. Mrs. Frisbee kept running, and her face struck a cold, hard wall of metal. A voice shouted, Mother, don't let Dragon in yet. I've caught a mouse. Billy, the younger Fitzgibbon's son, had been sitting on the kitchen stool, his feet up on the rug, eating berries from a colander. The colander, upside down, was now over Mrs. Frisbee. There ends chapter 22, Caught. Our next chapter is Seven Dead Rats. So we will have to see what that ominous title means. Ominous is a word to describe kind of a worrisome, little bit scary situation. So we'll have to see what's happening. It seems like there's some pretty intense action about to take place. At least that might be my thought. You'll have to think about what your guesses and hypotheses about what's going to happen are. 
All right, cool creatures. I love you dearly and I will be seeing you soon.